Hello? Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, how are we doing today? Are we hungover? Good, good. Um, well, let's start the day off right with some sex. Um, yeah, I'm Robert Yang. I'm a game developer and teacher at NYU Game Center and Parsons School for Design in New York City. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about why I'm so good at bad sex in games. In games. Oh, oops. What just happened? Okay, there. And I'm bad at PowerPoint, too. Um, content warning. Um, there are sexual images in this talk. Uh, so, you know, feel free to leave if you don't like what you're seeing at all. It's fine. Um, so, many years ago, I had some bad sex. Um, what happened was it was 3 a.m. and it was too late to take the train home because trains shut down sometimes in other cities. Um, and uh, of course, I knew it was I knew it was going to be too late. Uh, that's why I stayed. That's why I kept talking with him. Um, that's why I kept doing the things you know that people do. You know, we flirt and smile and nod and go ha 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 and stuff. And uh, and, you know, we were performing our best possible humans for each other. That's what dates are. Um, we both wanted to feel natural and spontaneous and perfect, uh, when really there wasn't anything really spontaneous about it. We both kind of knew what we wanted for a while. So, you know, we, we went back to his place for one last drink. Uh, and you know how that goes often. Um, you know, we ended up making out, and we take our clothes off and stuff, and jump into his bed and stuff, and, um, you know, time for some good, perfect sex now, right? Let's have some good, nice sex. But that's when he suddenly stops, and he looks at me, and he's like, wait, let's put some music on. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, if, if that's what you want, you know, people have sex with like music. That's a thing that like real people do. So let's, let's do that. Uh, so he jumps out of bed and he opens up his computer and he opens up Facebook. And right now I'm thinking like, uh, I'm like naked in your bed and you're like fucking checking your Facebook or something. What's up with that? And that's when he opens up Farmville. <laughs> um, we remember Farmville, right? Um, like, at this point, my brain is, like, fucking, like, exploding, right? Like, I thought you were going to play some music, but now you're checking your Farmville farm uh, on your computer. And, like, I can see him do this, right? Like, it's like a bad lie. I can see him check his Farmville farm. Um, and I'm watching him zoom into his Farmville farm, and it's actually, like, a pretty good Farmville farm. Um, <laughs> it's, like... He has like all these tomatoes and apples and strawberries and peaches. It's really impressive. Like he's really good at Farmville, I think. Um, and then over in the corner of his like Farmville farm or something is a jukebox. So that's when he clicks on the jukebox and it begins making these noises that I was later told were music. Um, it's like really bad, like think like, like 30 seconds of like generic dance music, like the dance music you hear in an elevator or like the stock sample music out of some like Hollywood movie or something. Um, and, and, and he tells me he doesn't have music on his computer. So he expects me to like, have sex to like the ringtones that come on your phone or something. Um, it's really bad. Am I, am I really that desperate? And the answer is yes, of course I'm that desperate. So I, I kept trying to have sex with him anyway, even though it's just like getting really bad. Um, but of course it's impossible to have sex in front of Farmville. Um, it's just really weird, but funny, but sad, but weird. Um, and my mind is racing. I can't focus on anything. So after a few minutes, I'm just like, okay, this isn't working, and we give up and just go to sleep or something. Um, and it was some pretty bad, pretty terrible sex. It was so bad, like, I never went out with that guy ever again. Um, 
was bad sex really that bad? Like, after all, bad sex taught me that I actually value music a lot, actually. <laughs> Um, you know, I never really paid attention to that aspect of sex before until I had really bad sex with bad music and that actually like flipped a switch in my brain. Um, you know, in a way like bad sex helps us think about sex and in that way it's kind of like important. Um, because sex is more than just like good or satisfying or something. Sex is also bad or sad or embarrassing or weird or funny or sad. You know, sex is like all of these things, right? That's like our whole experience of sex. And I think if you want to be like really positive about sex, you kind of have to embrace all these different ways that sex means in our lives. It's not always just this good, perfect, like pornography fantasy, right? I'm sure we all know that, we're all in video games, right? Um, so my friend Naomi Clark, uh, she's actually like a speaker here later, you should totally check her session out. Um, she has an amazing sex game called Sex Mix. Um, in Sex Mix, it's a game for two or more players, and first you take turns adding songs to a playlist and then all players begin sexual activity, and then the music starts. Um, if you react to the music, like if you pause, or if you like laugh, or, or, just pa or just do anything in any really clear way, you lose because you reacted to the music. You let this really bad music like, affect you. Um, but at the end of the playlist, if you haven't flinched or laughed or whatever, um, you win. Um, and I think it's really brilliant because I think sex mix kind of changes what good sex means. Um, here, good sex means like if you hear like uh, I want it that way by NSYNC or something, right? Um, you don't even notice it, right? You just take your clothes off any, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, right, you just do it anyway, you don't even care. Um, and most people would consider this to be bad sex, right? Um, and Naomi actually says this game will actually involve in you, you having worse sex than usual. Um, but here it's almost kind of like sweet and lovely, like, oh, you care about me so much, you want to have really bad sex with me. That's really nice, actually. Um, so with that Farmville guy, maybe I was just playing this sex mix game and I didn't even know it. I don't know. Um... And I think this, is, this kind of plays into like a really like important concept that came from gay and queer communities. Uh, this idea of camp. Um, it's where it's kind of fun to be like bad at something, to like fail at something, to not be like super convincing or great or whatever. Because as long as you're loud about it, as long as you're making a huge car wreck, a huge train, a huge um, deal out of it, you're a spectacle then it's worth it because that means you're visible. That means people are seeing you. They're not erasing you. They're not forgetting you. Um, and I think bad sex kind of speaks to that element of experience. And I think that's kind of the problem with a lot of popular depictions of sex in AAA video games. Um, I think the problem with AAA game industry sex is that it tries really hard to be good sex. Uh, or perfect sex, um, but we're all humans. We know that sex is rarely so perfect. Sex is usually very messy, right? Um, stuff comes out of holes, you know? Um, fluids just go all over the place. You know, you can't like put a towel down everywhere, right? So, but I think the popular AAA game industry stuff, they kind of think they can put like towels everywhere. And the sex part of the game is usually really just cut off from the rest of the game, right? Games that we associate with sex, like, like a God of War, which has like a sex mini game, or Mass Effect, or Dragon Age, or like Witcher 3, or even, even like the hot coffee mini game in Grand Theft Auto that got banned. Uh, all these games isolate sex from the rest of the game. Um, you know, in these games, sex never bleeds. Sex never oozes outside of the cutscene or mini game. Um, how can you enjoy sex if you don't accept that this is what bodies do during sex? You kind of have to accept it. 
Um, so I feel like sex involves negotiation, awkwardness, uncertainty, um, and these things are beautiful and they're valuable because they reflect our experiences of sex and they're important to share. Um, so with my games, personally at least, I kind of want to try to honor this depth and complexity of sex um, and messiness. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about my own work for the past like year and a half or so uh, and some other influences and kind of how they came about. This water's really good, by the way. Um, so the first game I made was a spanking game called Hurt Me Plenty. Um, and it was inspired by how BDSM and kink communities think about sex. Uh, to many of them, sex is made of at least three stages. Uh, there's negotiation, there's play, and then there's aftercare at the end. Negotiation is when you're talking about what you'd like to do and you um, try to think about what your boundaries are. Then play is maybe when you actually like go and try to do it. Um, and if you stop anytime, that's okay. You just have what's called aftercare, where you talk about how you felt like it went and your feelings, and if you feel like it didn't go as well as you would have hoped, you know, you, you say why. Um, and I never really seen sex explained to me like this before, um, and it made a lot of sense to me. Um, it's kind of about how pain is not the same thing as abuse. Only abuse is abuse. Um, and abuse takes many forms, and it's not always physical, and I think that's what BDSM and kink really show really powerfully. Um, I, the other thing I also really like about kink is the idea of the safe word, which ends sex whenever you say it. And I think it's really great because it implies that everyone has the power to end sex whenever they feel like it. And you can change your mind whenever you feel like it. Um, and I think that's a beautiful idea. And I tried to like, actually like, design and systematize those in my game. Um, so this has hurt me plenty. Um, you go through negotiation, you go through actually spanking him, and then you go through aftercare, where he tells you how he felt about how it went. Um, and um, it's, like, it's kind of hard to talk about consent and power with regards to video games, because at their core, uh, video games are pieces of software. Software has no rights, uh, really. Like, software is supposed to do whatever you say. And you can disable or delete software at any time. If software resists humans, we call that malware, right? And then we try to destroy it. Um, this seems really unfair. This is like, how is software supposed to meaningfully negotiate with me? How is a game supposed to negotiate with me if I can just delete the game at any time from my system? Um, you know, you can't negotiate with like a god, kind of. So that kind of led to the last system in this game. Um, where if you violate his boundaries and you continue past his safe word, he locks you out and he refuses to play with you. Sometimes for weeks in like real life, uh, the game will just say, sorry, I don't want to play with you. Here's a timer, come back in like four weeks. Um, and because I think it's the only real choice a computer program has whether to work or to not work. Um, and I think some players kind of get it. Some players really complain to me and whine to me that this is like a really harsh penalty, but I think this is actually a very light penalty. Realistically, the NPC sh should refuse to talk to you like ever again, except through their lawyer. So I feel like it's actually, you get off pretty light for them just waiting a month or something to talk to you again. Um, oh, and some players actually like reset the game's memory of your abuse and clear the memory, which is like really fucked up. <laughs> if you did that, you're like a bad person. Um, the next game I made was a game called Succulent, um, which has a very different tone. I try to like mix it up with each game. I want to try different like formal things, but also like thematic and tonal things. Uh, in Succulent, you um, kind of help this guy eat a popsicle, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it's kind of modeled off of a lot of the gay, like, homo hop. I mean, that's what straight people called it. Um, to us, it was just, like, hip-hop. Uh, music videos like uh, Caswell's Ice Cream Shop, so, like, the, that, those are the screens on the left. That's from that music video. As well as, like, Go Go Boy imagery, as well as, like, Leaf in the upper right. Um, and these kinds of imageries, they seem to, like, 
focus on very flat compositions, and he put sweaty dudes front and center, you know, like don't even try to hide it, right? Um, it's about being very obvious, very flamboyant, and very gay. Um, so this is what the game actually looks like. This is pretty much the only screen of the game. It really doesn't change from this. Um, you literally just watch this guy eat like a popsicle. Um, and the game is very loud. Um, it has a lot of moaning and sucking noises. Uh, it also has cheek physics. You can notice like on the right side of his cheek, it actually bulges out. That's from the popsicle going in his mouth. Uh, or ice block or whatever you call it in Europe. Um, and, um, you know, I worked really hard on those, like, cheek physics. I'm really interested in how we, like, simulate and depict bodies in general. And I felt like no other games really were doing cheek physics or, like, fellatio physics or whatever. Um, also, as, like, a gay Asian dude, I feel like I kind of, like, face a lot of, like, racism and pressure from a lot of gay men. Um, I feel like there's a certain type of gay man that I'm supposed to be. And here there are three clones of this type of gay man, I think. Um, and I felt like if I could just fit in with this like masculine, really athletic, muscular, like cis male, white ideal, um, you know, maybe I'd fit in, my life would be easier. And that's kind of like scary, the idea that we're all gonna be the same and fit into this one type. Um, so that's why at the end of the game, um, after he's done with the popsicle, he devours you as well, because uh, he's a succubus, and they devour your soul. And I feel like if we leave those ideas kind of unchecked, they will devour the soul of gay communities everywhere. Um, next, I made a game called Stick Shift. <coughs> um, Stick Shift is about having sex with your gay car, and you give your car a hand job. Um, the last two games, uh, Hurt Me Plenty and Succulent, basically play themselves. Uh, so I kind of wanted to uh, see if I could make a sex game that's a little difficult. And uh, in this game, nothing is explained. You have to kind of learn and feel the correct timing of shifting gears through constant and often embarrassing failure, uh, which resonates with many experiences of sex, I think. Um, how do you do sex? Well, some of you will never find out. Um, and that's okay, you know, sex can be intimidating, sex can be difficult. I wanna try to reflect that experience of sex as well. Um, I was inspired a lot by that, you know, that movie Drive with Ryan Gosling that like everyone was like all hot about. Um, and that movie kind of reminds me of driving in LA at night. I really like driving in LA at night. Uh, you feel like an astronaut because suddenly there's no traffic, no cars, just lights everywhere and you feel like you're in space a little bit. And when you're driving at night, you know, you're like alone with your car. There's like no one outside of your car. You're, you're like caressing your car. You're very intimate with your car, right? You touch your car a lot. Um, but how do you know how your car feels, really, right? Your car doesn't really have a face. So that bring, brings in this other big inspiration. Uh, Paolo Pedercini actually suggested to me that I adapt this short film by Andy Warhol called Blowjob. Uh, Blowjob is a film where you just watch a guy for like 20 minutes or something from the shoulders up. The camera never goes down. And you just watch his face change. And it's called Blowjob, so you can kind of guess what's happening um, probably down below. Um, but maybe nothing's happening. Maybe he's just like a really good actor or maybe he's a bad actor. Like, I actually, you don't really know, actually. And that's what's kind of really interesting about that. Um, but I wanted to kind of bring back that, like, expressive emotion back to stick shift. So how do you know how the car feels? Well, this guy is pretty much the face of the car. When you do something that's pleasing to the car, he'll smile. When you do something that, um, breaks the car or the car doesn't like, he'll like frown and look shocked kind of. Um, and I think that's kind of how we feel when we're driving often. Maybe driving is like a form of intimacy and sex. Um, then the next game I made um, was called Cobra Club. Uh, it's actually showing over in the gallery uh, if you check it out. Uh, Cobra Club is a dick pic photo studio game. Uh, and it was inspired a lot by this great website called Critique My Dick Pick. Uh, check it out, critiquemydickpick.tumblr.com. 
Uh, I was not paid to say that. Uh, which gives really good, like really earnest uh, reviews of dick pics. Uh, they kind of argue that anyone can take a good, sexy dick pic. It doesn't really matter about what your body is or whatever. You should just take dick pics to be proud of your own body. The dick pics are for you. Um, and that's why the character here is not a supermodel with like six pack abs or something. Um, you know, anyone should be able to feel sexy. Anyone should feel like their dick pics are good. Um, and maybe dick pics can be like a positive force in society. So here you can see some of the review here where it, it's saying, this dick pic sender has a lot going on inside it and it's kind of busy, right? It's actually true. The dick pic is kind of like, kind of does have too much going on. But it's not saying, oh, that's like a weird looking dick. You should be ashamed of yourself or something, right? It's saying, no, with a little bit of practice, you can make like, you know, get some lighting in there and so on. So this is what my dick pic game looks like. Um, you know, uh, you make dick pics, you chat with NPCs on a social network for dick pics. Um, and in the US, you know, dick pics don't have the best reputation, so I kind of wanted to like rehabilitate them a little bit. So sharing dick pics with other people in this game always requires consent from them. Uh, and when you receive dick pics, you only receive them if you tell them you want it. Um, and you usually do kind of want it. Um, and as I was making this, the Patriot Act was being renewed in the US. That's the US warrantless uh, mass surveillance spy law. Uh, and there was this argument, can the US government see your dick pics? And the answer was probably, yeah, they probably can. Um, so then I realized that these things are connected, right? Um, if you feel like someone's spying on you, you can't feel safe, you can't feel sexy, you can't feel in intimate. Um, so I feel like this is how sex can go bad in a bad way if you can't trust other people with that sex. Um, so in the game, the game actually leaks your dick pics and secretly sends your dick pics that you generate with the game without your permission to another server. Um, and then at the end of the game, everyone's like, why did you leak my dick pics to the internet? And then you're banned from the game. Um, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense, right? You violate trust, you violate boundaries, but you didn't even know you were and that's what spying can do. Um, this is kind of a constant theme in my sex games. Um, I kind of want to talk about like fantasies and the friction between the fantasy and real life. Um, so my, the most recent game I made was called Rinse and Repeat. That was a male shower simulator, the most technologically advanced male shower simulator, <laughs> as I like to say. Um, yeah, woo. Uh, gay men have this very common kind of locker room sex fantasy. Uh, if you watch gay porn, which all of you have, be honest. Um, it's traditionally actually like a very dangerous place for gay men. Like what if a straight guy decides you were checking him out and decides he doesn't like gays and then they basically like kick your ass, right? So it's basically the idea that locker rooms are actually really dangerous, but what if they were safe? What if they were like gay paradise or something? And that's kind of what these kinds of porn films are about. And that's kind of what this game is about. So you basically scrub this guy in the shower um, and he tells you whether you're going too fast or too slow. So it's actually kind of about tenderness uh, and you want to make sure you can please him. Um, but in order to shower with him, uh, you have to shower with him at specific times of the day in real life. And if you miss your chance, you have to wait until tomorrow in real life. Um, so my hope is that people put in their schedule. Uh, they hope that uh, you, know, you look forward to showering all day with this virtual hunky dude. Um, and the idea is that sex isn't always convenient. Sex doesn't wait for you. I want, instead of you playing the game, the game kind of plays you. Um, now, I'm not the only person making sex games. Um, there's so many people making sex games these days. Uh, Nina Freeman gave a really great talk, I think, last year about her experience with sex and games, too. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few other sex games that also kind of inspire me and I think function in kind of similar ways a little bit. Um, this game is also by New York by Consentical. You should t totally see her session talk. Uh, Consentical is a two-player card game um, about, you know, chaining cards. It's like Netrunner plus like tentacle sex. Um, so you're reading the other player to try to produce like satisfaction points. Those are like the agendas you score in like Netrunner or something. 
I don't know, it's really nerdy. Um, and, you, and you do all this stuff, and then that's like kind of your experience of sex, and then you do aftercare afterwards and talk about how you think the game went. And I think that's a really great way to like systematize sex. Um, that game is very much about developing your own relationship and figuring out what kind of sex you want to have. Um, but I think I'd like to question how we kind of consume sex. Um, question one, how many people in the world do you think are having sex right now? Two? Uh, yeah, okay, like maybe like two or something. Um, question two, how many people do you think are watching pornography right now? Six billion, 20 billion, right? Um, a lot of people, right? Probably a lot more people, I would say, than are having sex. Um, you know, sex is something we do all the time, but sex is also something we watch, and sex is also something we witness. And I think games are kind of undergoing this same shift. Uh, games are an artistic medium, but also like this culture, right? You participate in that culture by playing games, but you also go to festivals, you also watch Let's Plays and stuff, you also watch streamers on Twitch and stuff. Um, you know, people talk about games and watch other people play games, and that's often how we consume games. Um, so, the last game I kind of want to talk about is... Um, this game, um, it's basically one of the best sex games ever made and you'll probably never play it. And I'm gonna play a short video of it right now. Um, it's a mod of Sonic um, Generations or something and it replaces Sonic with a penis. <laughs> What matters about this game is that it was real, that it was performed, that it existed, that someone played it, and now we can watch this performance and understand it and feel like we're ascending to heaven with this penis. We're racing through an Italian town with this disembodied penis running around. And it's just kind of, now it's waiting, it's not sure what to do, but now it's running super fast. Now it's going to like, run, jump between all these buildings. Um, so I feel like when we make games, we should kind of learn from sex. And we should learn that sex is really fun to watch. Sex is really important to witness and see. Um, and I think this is what this game demonstrates. When we make games, not just sex games, you should think about how fun they are to watch, how fun they are to think about, how fun they are to kind of conceptualize and imagine, right? And I think that, in the end, is what will best serve games culture. I want to play the whole video, but I don't think we have time. I think I, like, ran out of time. Um, anyway, um, and that was me. Thanks. Um, and uh, I don't usually do Q&A, and today will be no exception. Um, so just talk to me, I'll be around for the festival if you want to like, ask me a question or something. Bye, thanks. <laughs>